Friday, everybody. Thanks for joining us on What the Truck. I'm your host, Dooner. Before jumping into things, my mind's on someone, so I just want to say something nice about him. My dad had a uh, scare yesterday. He's um, in the hospital right now. He's stabilized. He's fine, but he's got to have a big surgery coming up on Monday. So I, uh, after the show, I'm heading down there. I'm going to go be with the family next week. Um, our great team here will be playing some greatest hits during next week. Um, I think the big man will be good. I think the big man will be good. I know a lot of you road doggers out there. You look to the man upstairs. So if you could, throw a little prayer up. Thank you very much. All right, we got a super stack show today. It's episode 710 of What the Truck. I'm very excited to be joined by the University of Tennessee's Global Supply Chain Institute. We're going to learn about trends in nuclear verdicts that are causing astronomical jury awards with Anthony Slamar. We got Reliance Partners' Mark Barler. He gets us ready for CVS Road Check Week. But first, it's armchair attorney Matthew Leffler to set the record straight on the FTC's rule banning non-completes. Matthew's going to do a little bit of a TL. LDR. We've noticed on LinkedIn and some sites, some people may be jumping the gun with their thoughts on this. There's been some misconceptions. So we're going to give you a, uh, an overview on here, relatively brief. Matt will do a deep dive on his own channel. Matt, thanks so much for uh, stepping in to help us out with this. Happy to be here, Dooner. What we are seeing is a seismic change in the employment landscape. Back in January of 2023, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, announced it was going to uh, propose a rule banning non-competition agreements. These are contracts entered into between employees and employers that restrict the employee after they leave their job uh, to not do a certain type of job for a period of time in a geographic area. After over 20,000 comments were submitted, the FTC FTC just a couple of days ago finally put out the final rule, which will ban non-competition agreements for the vast majority of working Americans. The, the numbers are staggering. Over 30 million people, one in five working Americans, have a non-competition agreement. And this rulemaking has come to the fruition of a lot of effort over decades of people trying to fight these things. So the, Matthew, this, this is the result. Getting a, this is the result of a lot of commentary. Uh, they took a lot of commentary for people who've been under non competes. I'll, I'll tell you my own brief story. Um, in twenty, in late twenty fifteen, I was fired from a sales job. I had a ninety day non compete. I started I, by accident a day early at this new company. They overnight mailed the non compete. They threatened to sue. Uh, all these kind of things. It made the job super awkward. I ended up having to go to another place. I know people have worst horror stories, but what does it mean right now? Now for workers. What it means for workers right now is we're we're waiting. There's a pause that's taking place. Ultimately, the rule has to go to the federal register. It will then be put out for 120 days and then go into effect. However, just a couple of days ago on Wednesday, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has filed a lawsuit in the state of Texas challenging the FTC's proposed ban. And what might end up happening is the rule may be enjoined. So for workers right now, the hope is in 120 days or so, all non-competes in this country are done for the most part. However, this is just the beginning. This thing may go on for many, many months, if not several years. And also for workers, one thing to understand, I guess it's worth pointing out because there's been a lot of misconceptions with non-compete, non-solicit, and exactly when this sort of term expires and what it means for a worker's liability. Um, just briefly to those who are confused, the non-solicit is what means you can't go call on the customers from your company. The non-compete is what prevents you from going to work from another 3PL in your industry. I know a lot of brokers are under these things, especially in our industry. Probably the largest like working class is probably freight brokers and 3PL workers covered by this is that true? Yeah, I mean, this is a, this impacts everybody from doctors to nurses, anesthesiologists, genitation, yeah. uh, everybody's impacted by these things. A non-solicit, you're exactly right. It means you can't reach out and ask for them to come work with you. They That's can so come important. to you. Yeah, They can come and work with you if they want to, your former customers, your former coworkers. The non-compete says whatever you've been trained to do, you can't do that now. You can't do that in this area for this amount of time. And if you do, we're going to send you a cease and desist letter. And we're going to also go to your new employer and send them a cease and desist, threatening them with litigation. So this is, I, this is all over the place. What happens if I quit my job on Monday? I'm in a state that is still uh, very uh, non-compete friendly. Is this not a good idea? 
Yeah, I mean, you're going to, if you are in the midst of a non competition agreement, you can be sued. You have no way to insure yourself against the liability. It can be $20,000, $30,000 a month to deal with the litigation around these things. So it is incredibly important for working Americans to understand that this is a moment in time that we need to remember. This FTC rule may or may not stand. We don't actually know the outcome as this gets litigated. But what it does show is that there are millions of people who are impacted by these things. And if you want to see non-competes end for good, the thing you have to do is don't sign them. Don't agree to them. But if you're forced to sign these things because you might get fired otherwise, understand that the government may not come and save you. You should be calling your members of Congress. You should be talking to people in your state legislatures. There are still ways to protect yourself, but the government may not be the one who comes and saves you ultimately. You need to be aware of what restrictions can actually happen happen. And what happens when you get sued, you can go bankrupt. You can lose everything because that is what these hiring entities do when they push out non-competes to their workforce. Matt, what does it, okay, what does it mean for employers then? Because employers themselves may be opening themselves up to some liability. There's some changes. I've heard they may have to avoid these things. I know that may not be yet. So what, if I'm an employer, I have non-compete agreements out there. What should I be thinking about right now? The first thing that I would be thinking about as an employer is calling my attorney and making sure that I understand what risks are in front of me. At the end of the day, this rule may or may not be forced on everybody. The, the reality is there are real challenges about the statutory authority. But if you want to go out there and say, I think it's going to be knocked down, I'm not going to comply, you are in for a world of hurt. What will happen for employers under this rule as it stands right now is after 120 days, you are going to send out a memo to your existing employees and probably even some of your former employees, whether it's email or a letter itself, and say, hey, uh, this non-compete that you have, we will not enforce it. It's not going to invalidate all the non-competes. It's going to tell them that they cannot legally enforce it. And once that happens, all these non-competes that are out there are basically done. They're 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 out of the out of the out of the running. But if I'm an employer, I want to talk to my lawyers right away to understand what is the liability that's in front of me. Yeah, you know, there's been some people on LinkedIn who've been very sort of dismissive. They're like, what, you think you're a rock star? Why are you so happy about this? And and I got to say, I don't think those people have, have experienced being locked out of a job by a non-compete. I don't think they have that personal experience because it's hard not to get a little emotional when you personally have around that kind of thing. It's not about being a rock star. It's just about having the freedom to perform a craft that you've worked on. This is America. You should be able to work in the industry that you're trained in. You're exactly right. This is at will employment for literally every American. They can fire you as a hiring entity for any reason, as long as not a protected reason. There's no pensions. There's no unions. This is a different employment world. If you look at it today, this is the employer saying, not only am I going to let you go for whatever reason I want to, but I'm going to follow you and I'm going to learn about what you're doing. And if I think you're doing something that I don't like, I will ruin your life. We as Americans believe in the ability to compete. We think the best idea should win. We want the best opportunities for folks. And non-competes stifle innovation. The whole message around the FTC's rule, not just on the unfair practices side, is American workers need to make more money. And you make more money by changing jobs. That is the nature of this industry, nature of every industry right now. And to make it difficult to practice your honed craft is absolutely absurd. I think non-solicits have a place. But in this new sure. world of non-competes, if it's not today, it will be someday, and these things will go away because they are deeply, deeply un-American. Now, Matt, before I let you go and, and tell people where to find your stuff uh, real quick, what, what should we be looking at next? What's the next step in this? You're going to watch the most... Uh, aggressive litigation we've seen in many years. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce has already filed a lawsuit. They were very clear initially of this thing. The American Trucking Associations may join on. We don't know that yet. But the reality is there are business interests that are looking at the billions of dollars that will be paid to employees if this rule ends up going into effect. They will fight this. For those who are watching, it may be similar to what we saw with OSHA and the, the mandate around vaccinations. The question is, does the uh, FTC have the statutory authority to make a rule like this. If they don't, the rule goes away, which is when Congress can certainly come in and give them that authority. But this is what's going to happen over the next few months is to understand, will this rule be paused? We call it enjoined in the law, or will it go into effect? And if it goes into effect, that's a huge win for Americans. If it gets enjoined, do not despair. The fight is just beginning.
Matthew, you have done an awesome job. Where can people find your deep dive on this? I, I know you cover this uh, deeply on social. I've been following this issue since 2022. I've been presented with four non-competes in my career. I've signed two. I've refused to sign two others. This is the world we live in. You can find me on LinkedIn, Matthew Leffler. Find me on uh, Twitter, Armchair Addy. But this is an issue that affects every single American. It is bipartisan. There is no doubt that we as Americans need to get rid of non-competes. And I am excited to watch everybody in this ecosystem understand what the stakes are and fight for what's right for American workers. Thank you, Matt. You have my vote in November. Take care, sir. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Take it easy. All right, everybody. Meanwhile. At a party, you're minding your own business. A big bully comes up and starts to rap. You're kind of a jerk, kind of a little short, punky. <laughs> okay. Is it dirty? Okay. But it works. By the way, congratulations to uh, my boys, seven, nine-year-old. They were white belts. They took their test yesterday, and now they are yellow belts learning self-defense, although in Kempo, they have not learned the spit technique. But right now, Anthony Slammer, risk control transportation specialist at Northland Trucking Risk Control. Hello, Anthony. Hey, how are you doing? Good to be here. Doing? Yeah, good to have you back. Can you, can you hear me okay? Hey. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay. Well, hey, welcome. Welcome back to the show. Welcome back to the show. One of the things that we're talking about today, very, very important topic is the trend in nuclear verdicts. There's actually even a headline on Freight Waves right now talking about this, this topic and the statistics. I'm very excited to jump in on it with you. Yeah, absolutely. So, hey, good to be here again. Um, Nuclear verdicts, a uh, very important trend uh, within the transportation industry, right? Uh, kind of a growing concern in a lot of regards. Um, what a nuclear verdict is, it's essentially when a jury awards uh, exceed $10 million or more, right? Um, when we look at this, when we look at the last nine years of, of, of data, we've actually seen a 1,000% increase um, in, in verdicts related to truck crashes. So this is, this is a hugely important topic to talk about. Um, knowing this information, um, what we want to do is we don't want to have fear, right? We want to look at this. We want to say to ourselves, how can we as an organization improve our fleet safety posture? Um, how can we look at different driver training and coaching opportunities? How can we look at the improvement of our fleet safety program? And again, we want to be as safe as possible out there on the road. Yeah, I, I like where you're going with this. You mentioned astronomical jury awards. Can you give an example of, of something like that? Yeah, absolutely. So every year there's a report that comes out. It's called the Top 100 Verdicts in the United States. Um, essentially, it, it covers you know significant, significant um, awards by juries. Um, two examples come to mind. Uh, one of them involved an intersection accident. Uh, in this particular instance, there was a tractor trailer uh, that broadsided an SUV. Um, jury awarded $70 million in that case. Another example would include a rear end collision. Um, this time involving a nurse, um, jury awarded over $40 million in that, in that case. Um, so these are obviously significant dollar amounts, right? Um, without going into all the details of the cases, it's important to understand what these are. It's important to understand that despite no matter what size company you have, if it's a small fleet, mid-sized fleet, or large fleet, these represent significant uh, losses that the company has to, has to encounter, right? So ultimately, we want to look at this and we want to we ask ourselves, how can we make our organization better? Yeah, well, I, and uh, important words are, well, how can we? How can I uh, coaching and driver training help make a fleet better here and prevent some of all this? Yeah, for sure. So let's let's use the two examples we just talked about, intersections and rear end collisions. When we let's talk about intersections first. Um, intersections obviously uh, represent um, a, a more higher risk out there on the road, right? People are turning left, they're turning right, they're slowing down, they're speeding up, they're stopping, they're turning in front of you. All different types of things happen at an intersection. This represents a really good training opportunity for our drivers. Throughout the year, we should be, we should be providing training in a variety of topics. And uh, intersection safety would be an excellent opportunity uh, to review that with drivers, okay? Uh, rear end collisions. A lot of rear end collisions are related to speed and space management, okay? 
and also distracted driving, right? Uh, and it's good that we're talking about this, especially during this month, which is Distracted Driving Awareness Month, okay? Um, so speed and, speed and space management, really good things to reiterate with our drivers throughout the year. In addition to driver coaching, training, we may have some technologies that are available to us, okay? One of those would include um, telematics. A lot of companies are using telematics these days. Essentially, telematics company is going to provide you with what's called a driver scorecard. All right, so this is information based on driver's behavior. It can highlight risky driving behavior that you might not want to uh, uh, have occur in your fleet. It's important to use this information. Okay, that's, that's really big. Um, keep in mind, you're paying per truck per month for this information. So however you have it established between you and the telematics company, whether it's an email, uh, an alert on your phone, or through the telematics website, um, you want to use that information and address dri risky driving behavior. Examples could include speeding, hard braking, hard cornering, things like that. Another technology that a lot of vehicles are equipped with is ADAS, ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. Uh, these include pre-collision assists, lane keeping assists, uh, alerts and warnings that occur inside the cab of the vehicle uh, to alert the driver if the vehicle thinks you're going to come into contact with something or if, or if a crash is imminent. So all these types of things we can really use uh, to improve our overall uh, safety posture out there on the road. Anthony, very good. Anything, any examples we missed there? And if not, where can people go learn more about this and get more info from your team? Yeah, you know, another, another example that comes to mind uh, involves a award that was actually over $240 million. Whoa. Um, this one involved a fatality, unfortunately. Uh, so kind of a big big, big loss that the company had to incur. Uh, this one, this one happened when a vehicle was uh, at the point of delivery, backing up their vehicle. Uh, the trailer was blocking oncoming traffic. A vehicle came by, struck the trailer, and unfortunately, the motorist died. Um, so big part of trucking, we all know this, is trip planning, route selection, right? So we, we, always, we always talk about what happens from point A to point B. Um, but we also want to talk about what happens at point B, right at the point of delivery. We want to talk about how to pos safely position our vehicle. Uh, sure. We want to talk about how to reduce risks when we're doing that, so we're not, you know, posing additional hazards um, uh, to other motorists out there on the road. And uh, we have a lot of great resources on our website, um, Northland Insurance. Our, our website is NorthlandINS.com. Uh, that's NorthlandINS.com. Uh, we have a ton of trucking uh, resources, ton of safety material. Uh, for people to look at. Um, we love trucking. It's what we do at Northland Insurance. Um, we, we, we love the trucking industry. Um, we have a group of outstanding safety professionals that meet with our customers every week. Right. And uh, fleet safety, it's, it's, it's what we do and we love it. Uh, thank you. I, I believe you. Thank you so much for your insights today. Nuclear verdicts, a trend that's not going away. If you want a, uh, if you want a, this, if you want, this was a shot. If you want the chaser on this, John Gallagher has a great article up. Here is just one stat. It blew me away because you mentioned that two, four, 240 million award. Um, people go, wow, that's crazy. But look at this number. In 2022, crashes in the U.S. resulted in 494 deaths and over $5.5 billion in costs. This is not going away. Go check out his site. Go get that information. Anthony, thank you so much. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Take care. All right, let's, uh, let's play a little preview for our next guest. We have a great little video. There's an energy on Rocky Top and an understanding that collaboration only makes you more competitive. Give it back. Because wins are better when they're shared with a team. The winner is Tennessee. This is a university on the rise, lighting the way in everything we do from theater to supply chain management to advanced materials. Earning our successes together, reaching new heights. We're harnessing the power of the world's fastest computer and leveraging international partnerships. Creating leaders in the field, on the field, and in every field. Measuring success by the impact we have on our communities. The best way to rise? is to lift others up, elevate ideas, and reach for the summit together. It's football time in Tennessee. It takes each one of us giving our all. It takes a volunteer. 
Welcome to the show, volunteers. Thank you for coming out. We got the University of Tennessee Knoxville's Global Supply Chain Institute, Mr. Thomas Deakins. We got Lance Sanders and some students I've never even met before. I'm so excited to have you all on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having us dinner. We're uh, we're excited to be on, and we want to talk about a lot of the great things we got going on here in Rocky Top. So thanks for having us on the show. Absolutely. You're on that beautiful Knoxville campus out there. Now, who else is with you? Who's in the room today? Well, we'll do introductions. So uh, I am joined today by one of our uh, professors and one of my colleagues, um, and I'll let yeah. him introduce uh, I'm Lance Saunders. I'm the Rattlers Professor of Supply Chain uh, in the department. We got students. My name is Olivia Daniels. I'm a senior. I graduate in a month. Ooh, I'm congratulations. I'm a junior, um, so I'll graduate in a year. All right. I'm Laura Featherling, and I'm also a senior. So and I'm Riley Winningham, him too. Also a senior. Oh, wow. So we got three. Dear, well, Thomas, are they graduating? Have they done well enough, or are you, you holding them back? No, they're going to graduate, <laughs> and uh, you know, May 18th is the big day, so it's the countdown is on here. You know, this is so cool. When I was, I, I'm, I'm an old man. So when I was looking for, for colleges, there were not a lot of uh, supply chain programs out there. And I was looking on your site and you guys started this in 2011. So you've been doing this for over a decade now. You've been running the program. What is the program now? What are, what are students learning with you? Well, let me, let me clarify something. 2011 is when the Global Supply Chain Institute started. Uh -huh. The 1930s is when this department really became... Uh, or well, was born. Um, and so it was actually a Department of Transportation at the time, Transportation and Logistics. Then it's evolved into supply chain. Um, so we've been around for a long time. And uh, it's kind of like, I like to talk about it from the standpoint of, um, you know, how you have in uh, football and people talk about the coaching tree. It's so funny if you look back to see where a lot of the different uh, professors and the department and the new universities and departments have come from. They come out of that coaching tree basically from UT. So we're very proud of that as well. Very, very cool. So when, when you say that, what how, like programs can mean a lot of things. When you are a student entering this, let's talk undergrads first. What, why would undergrads come to this program? Who exactly is it for? Um, you know, I think we're really proud of our program because we truly take an end-to-end -end perspective. Um, if you come and are, graduate from our program, you're going to be exposed to classes focused on all the different functions in supply chain, plan, source, make, deliver. Um, not a lot of programs, if any, can say that their students truly get that end-to-end -end perspective um, that our students get by the time they graduate. Yeah, and let's, uh, you know, dinner, let's ask one of our students, ask them why they came to UT and why did they major in supply chain? How's that? Absolutely. Let's go around the room a little bit. What is your UT story? What what brought you into supply chain? It's um lately, it's been more mainstream lately, but before like the Suez Canal and maybe like toilet paper being at a grocery store, not a lot of people thought about supply chain. <laughs> um, for me, I am a transfer student, so I transferred to UT my sophomore year. Um, based on the fact that UT had the best supply chain program in the state. So I initially went into college wanting to do something in business. I wasn't sure what, and then supply chain became all over the news, and I kind of looked more into it and decided that, you know, UT was that best option for me. Awesome. Interesting. Do you have an idea where you, like, where you want to focus after this? Or are you looking maybe in, like, procurement or, or ops? Like, where's, that? Where, where's the next step after this program for you? Um, for me, I am going to work for Westrock, and I will be a logistics planner. I previously interned with them in logistics procurement. So right now, I definitely see myself in the logistics and transportation space for the next few years after graduation. Very cool. I did see that on your site. There was an internship requirement, which is very cool. So you get some actual hands-on experience. You get to make relationships with companies and see a little bit how the, the sausage is made and understand the world that you're stepping into a little bit. How about, how about, uh, how about your story, sir? Um, yeah, so I came here um, as a freshman. I knew some of the faculty um, coming in, and uh, they were really good people and just kind of encouraging me to, to step into supply chain. Um, and, and still came? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I got roped into it, and I never left. Um, but so far, so good. It's, it's a really rewarding program. Um, lots of super unique opportunities. And, um, yeah, I'm super grateful to, to have this opportunity. Anything stand out to you that, that you're sort of learning about or, or that you're excited about? There's, um, I mean, there's a lot of big changes coming in, a lot of talk about robotics, automation, uh, AI stepping into the field, as well as like the very bare bones, physical side of freight. Um, anything stick out to you? 
Yeah, there's there, um, there's a couple sustainability classes you can take, which I think are, are really interesting, especially moving forward. Um, you know, that's definitely going to be a big part of our lives um, as we progress through, you know, our careers and, and looking at ways to maximize supply chains. So, um, yeah, definitely kind of that focus on sustainability is, is a, a really important thing. No, I agree with you. It's going to be it's, it, the pressure on that put on by shippers and and a lot of these intermediaries themselves. You're seeing this. I mean, I have guests come on all the time. They want to promote and talk about their sustainability. These initiatives are are being pushed through one way or the other. So it's a great idea to get ahead of it and to learn that kind of stuff. Um, who else has a great story? Uh, why, why did you come over to the program? Yeah, so I originally started in just plain management um, and ended up moving into supply chain after my freshman year. I just kind of saw all the opportunities that came with being in supply chain here at Tennessee. So decided to make that switch into supply chain. Very cool. Any plans after the program? Yes, I will be joining HF Sinclair in Dallas. Very, very nice. Look at this. Jobs right out the door. How about you, sir? What are you going to what do you why did you join the program and where are you going? Yeah, so I started out in finance and learned pretty quickly that that wasn't for me. I wanted to do something a little bit different every day, and, and supply chain was that challenge. I love to be challenged, and, and that's really was a perfect fit for me. Um, so afterwards, I will be joining JB Hunt in Final Mile Transportation. Um, I'll do the manager trainee program and then get placed somewhere in the southeast after that training. Very well. Hey, uh, congratulations to all of you. That is super exciting. Th Thomas, let me ask you a question. Um, you've been with the program for a little bit now. What What is the biggest difference between the this newer generation of supply chain students and maybe ones we've seen in the past? I think the, the different, well, and that'd be good for Lance to answer too. But oh, sure, I, I Lance, think yeah. right now we're seeing, we're seeing students who um, obviously embrace technology, right? And they, they think in a different way and they learn in a different way. And um, I think one of the big things right now is, you know, the, the students want to uh, be engaged and be engaged different, but they all, at the end of the day, supply chain students have um, analytical um, capabilities and they can solve problems. And if you think about it, I like to explain what supply chain is, is, is if you like to put puzzles together or figure figure things out like that, supply chain is a perfect, a perfect um, career for you. Lance, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually went as an undergrad to UT and I thank the good Lord every day that I'm not coming out now because a lot of these students just blow me away. Um, you know, you uh, top being on the rise. And I think I spent most of my time um, at different establishments that were not university related when I was in school. And these, these <laughs> students um, just are so impressive when they come in, you know, um, they're doing internships. Like you said, um, one of the things we're really proud about here is that we have close connections with industry. Our forum has 90 companies now, plus companies that are invest, that have partnered with us to invest in us um, so we can develop students. And if you want a job, it's hard not to have one by the time you graduate from our program because you're being prepared. Um, and these students are taking advantage of that. And, you know, I, I look at them and I'm just glad I'm not competing against them when I graduate. Yeah, wow. yeah we've got over 400 students will graduate in May. And a huge percentage of those students have jobs and, you know, in different different areas of supply chain going to different parts of the U.S. We even have one student who's going to work with the space program. Uh, you know, um, it's this industry is so great because there's it for a lot of people, it becomes like they tried something else and they end up in supply chain. And now we have this other generation coming in. They're getting university educated. They're getting internships. They're getting real world experience. And they're entering at a very good time because not only is supply chain growing, but you're one of the first classes coming in that's really been educated from the ground up with a clear direction to go into supply chain and forging these these bonds right out of school. You hear so much about, you know, just generally people grumbling, oh, I went to college and I can't get a job afterwards. And I'm hearing you say everyone in this room has a job afterwards. They do. And, and what's funny also, if you look at, at these students, they have one, two, maybe three internships before they graduate. So they go in to figure out what part of supply chain in that field that makes them tick and to be able to go to work for a company. So that's really cool. And I also have to point out, I love your hat. Oh, you know, thank you. I had to wear it because you guys were, were coming on, you know, I had to cheer for the home team. Down here, um, how, how about the uh, how about the um, the um, uh, we did undergrads? How about the, the MBA program? Do you have one of those as well? We've got an MBA program, the traditional MBA program. We've got an 
executive MBA program that focuses specifically in global supply chain, which is ranked number one. Uh, we also have a master's in supply chain, which is online. Um, so we've got multiple options for people if they want to um, expand their career. And then we also have our uh, what we call our graduate executive education, where uh, we focus specifically on areas in supply chain. So, for instance, we have a supply chain um, uh, supply chain leadership academy. We have a supply chain planning academy that we're starting. We have supply chain finance academy. Just different um, different areas of supply chain that you can take these courses to get um, you know, up to speed on. Um, and then we also have another thing where Lance mentioned earlier is about our forum. We have uh, about 90 corporate partners that come together um, and work with our students and our faculty. And one of those initiatives that we have that comes out of that is called our Advanced Supply Chain Collaborative, where um, companies can partner with our faculty to address a specific issue that they're dealing with in supply chain but they can also collaborate with other forum members on a specific topic. And Lance works in that, uh, in, in, in that part of the, uh, of yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. I, I, I know this is going to sound, you know, no duh to you, but you would be surprised. Our chancellor talked this week about how as a land grant institution, we want our research to be not just academically rigorous, but practically relevant. And so, because of that, um, we have partnered. There's usually 10 to 12 companies and we come together once a year to set where what are some relevant problems that also are pushing forward in the field that um, faculty would be interested in partnering with us to um, help address. And so we partner with those companies. We set those projects once a year. Um, my research the last five years has been focused on supply chain planning. I've got to work with some great companies like Snyder Electric, Bush Beans, um, Eastman, um, to help them look at their planning process, develop new innovative solutions. Um, and it's also advanced my academic um, publishing record. So it's a win-win. Um, and I know that sounds like something that we should be doing, but I'll tell you a lot of institutions don't do that. And we're really proud of that, that we're actually partnering with companies to solve real world problems that actually have academic relevance too. Very interesting. You know, I, there's a topic that um, gets repeated to me often and often. I have, I have DMs from people who work in this industry all the time. We keep publishing reports on it. The insurance brokers keep bringing it up and it's fraud, theft, and cybersecurity in this. Um, is that coming up a lot in your program now too? Because I know out here, like in the real world, it's coming up all the time and it's costing a lot of money. It, it is. We have one professor that, um, that specializes in cybersecurity as well. Um, and yes, we uh, partner with companies like Axel Logistics is, you know, one local one here in town. We talk to you know, Sean McLeod a lot of times. Sean, Sean's on our advisory board for our um, um, in the Global Supply Chain Institute for our forum. And, you know, uh, we collaborate and talk about all these different topics. And, um, yes, that does come up a lot. and It's one of the hottest things, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. And we have an elective that all of our students um, can take focused on supply chain technology that addresses a lot of those very topics. I would recommend taking that elective to uh, future prospective students that may be listening to us. It, it's only just like sustainability. It's only going to be a growing problem as more tech comes into the industry. More exploits will naturally come into the industry as well. Now, before we sing a little Rocky Top and before I let you go, who don't you want in the program? Who shouldn't apply? Who is this not for? I think, and I'll let the students um, comment if they want to on this. Um, I would say someone who wants to just be able to come in and do something that's more, um, you know, I can look forward to it. I know what I'm going to do every day. That's not what supply chain is about. We really want our students to be problem solvers mm -hmm. and not be afraid of the ambiguous. Um, understand that you're never going to be able to make decisions with complete information and to get the best information possible. Um, and that's where the data analytics comes in and make decisions under uncertainty. Um, and I think that's like Thomas said, one of the fun parts about supply chain is you're really trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. It's not just about optimizing your little part um, of the business. It's about optimizing the whole. And we hope our students take away from that. But people that are uncomfortable with being uncomfortable probably shouldn't. Uh, being our program. Yeah, we're going to challenge you, that's for sure. 
and they i love to hey that's this world that's this world there's there's things come up and problems come up all the time uh the the easy stuff is when everything's running smoothly the real players the real superstars that shine the real diamonds in the business are the ones who can put those fires out because problems always happen you guys are awesome i want to be like rodney dangerfield and go back to school I'll, i'll look into that but in the meantime how about a little rocky top let's do it Child, you'll always be a sweet cow home to me. Good old Rocky Top. Rocky Top Dan at sea. Woo! <laughs> you guys are... You guys are amazing. For those who are listening, they want to join the program or they just want some more information, where do I send them to? You can go to supplychainmanagement.utk.edu um, and, you know, you can you just... Just uh, or you can ping us. We're also on all the social platforms uh, and LinkedIn. Cool. And coincidentally, I will see you in Miami next month, sir. It'll be good to see you in person. Thanks so much for stopping by the show. Thank you to the students. And um, hey, a little cowbell for your graduation. I know at least three of you are done with the program. Amazing work. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, dude. Thanks, Thanks for having us on. Thank you. Take it easy. All right. Elsewhere. Oh, he's missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-oh, Scott. Scott, you're a little off. You're off. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. All right. There's a nicer way to say that. Uh, no, I just want to make sure you heard me. This, yeah, but you didn't have to be so mean about it. Was I mean? Did it sound mean? A little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. You say, hey, Scott, I'm just wondering. Right now you want me to say? <laughs> <laughs> just be as passive as possible. Yeah, I think you might what? be off. <laughs> like that. Are, are you off? Well, I, I want to make like, sure. I, I, I can't hang with these. Can you drop these people? I can't even take that anymore. I can't take it. I'm from Massachusetts. We, we are very direct with people. All right, Mark Barler, Director of DOT Regulatory Compliance at Reliance Partners. Hey, sir, thanks for coming on to close down the show with me. I know that there's a big event coming up, the CVSA Road Check Week. What are the exact dates on that? Is that... May 14th to 16th. May 14th, 15th, and 16th. 72 hours of truck checks throughout the United States and Canada. They're looking, what are they looking for this year? They're looking for drugs and booze, right? As well as uh, tractor protection systems. Yep, there's two things. Uh, normally they focus on one item, but they're, this year they're focusing on two. Uh, the first is going to be controlled substances and alcohol possession. The other is going to be your tractor protection valve and anti anti-bleed back systems for a tractor trailer combinations interesting so this means they're going to do some cab searches right so like do like a scan your cab make sure you didn't leave like a you know like a little bottle of fireball into a seat or something like because they're are they going to come in your truck what should you be doing to prepare for that aspect of it don't have anything in your truck that's not supposed to be in there that's what you got to do right um and yeah more, at most of the safety and weight facilities throughout the country, you're probably going to have uh, canines out there. You're going to have uh, drug and alcohol expert officers out there talking to drivers. They're going to ask to search your vehicle. My recommendation, never give them permission. They're going to search it if they have probable cause. But if they yeah. ask you to search it, just say no. Interesting. Now, they're not going to do like, this isn't like a, like a New Year's or like a St. Patrick's Day sobriety checkpoint, though. It's more of a cab search. Yeah, what they're looking for is to make sure that the, the drivers are okay to drive. They're not transporting anything. They don't have any personal use stuff and they don't have any alcohol in the vehicle. Because as we well know, a tractor trailer units going up to 80,000 pounds. That's a huge risk, not only for the uh, traveling public, but for the motor carriers and the risk that they take on. You know, if, if if drivers are doing things that they're not supposed to do. Yeah, well, before you like we started uh, the show earlier talking about nuclear verdicts and the big rise in trend. Um, John Gallagher had an article on freight waves that had some, in 2022 crashes resulted in 494 deaths was over five point five billion dollars in costs. And that hurts everyone in the industry because it raises insurance rates and all that kind of stuff as well. Now, the other aspect of this is the tractor protection systems. What are they going to be looking for here? What do I need to look for so I don't get nabbed? This is kind of an involved process um, for you to check it yourself. You're pretty much going to need two people to do these checks prior to uh, international road check. So the first thing you got to do, you got to set your brakes, get out of the vehicle, chalk your tires, get back into your truck, push in both your push pull valves. So you got to release the brakes on the entire vehicle. Like you're going to drive away. You got to get your vehicle up to pressure. Once we're up to pressure, you can shut your vehicle off. You got to step back out of the vehicle. 
And then what you do is you take you disconnect both airlines from the tractor to the trailer, both the supply and the service side. Now your supply, that's the red line. Your service is going to be the blue line. Now when you do that, you're going to hear that the uh, uh, brakes on the trailer should set up automatically. You're going to want to check to make sure that there's no air coming out of either side of the trailer connections, right? Now, some tractors, the second part, that's the anti-bleedback system. The tractor protection valves, once you disconnect those lines, you may get a rush of air coming out of the supply side. Now, that air supply should shut off um, by it the time it reaches 20 PSI on the gauge inside the cab. A lot of uh, tractors, that, that um, push-pull valve for the trailer is going to pop out automatically. It's just going to come right out. But other ones, they will. the air is going to escape out, and once it hits about 20 PSI, can't get below 20 PSI, um, then that valve has to pop out. If it doesn't pop out, gets below 20 PSI, that's an out-of-service violation if discovered during an inspection. So make sure that uh, if that is if that is a problem with your tractor right now, get it fixed before international road check. Now, the once that uh, supply side shuts off, you got to listen and feel for air coming out of that supply side. Put your thumb over the hole on your airline. Take it off after a few seconds. If any pressure builds up underneath there or you could hear air escaping out, your tractor protection valve is not working properly. Then you have to step on the, on your brake and no air should come out of the service side airline. That's your blue line. If any air escapes out of there, then that's also an out of service violation and your tractor protection valve is not working properly. So it's kind of an involved process, but once you do it a couple of times, you never forget it. Yeah. Uh, how about pre-trip inspections? If I'm like, I'm not the driver, I'm the safety manager. Should I be out in the yard during this week auditing pre-trip inspections, making sure drivers are know what they need to do or doing what they need to do? Absolutely. Since this is going to be a focus, a lot of these facilities will be open for 72 hours straight. That means they're working third shift. And if you're if you normally drive at night, check your tractor. They're going to be checking it. Um, so, yeah. Get everything checked prior to truck check because if you get caught during during the truck check, you're going to be out of service and you got to get it fixed there or your vehicle can be towed by an authorized tow truck. Nobody wants that because you're talking thousands of dollars at that point and lost time. Yeah. Yeah. And clean the inside of that cab. Like no one's saying that you were necessarily drinking in your cab. But if you like had home time, let's say you went to the grocery store, something fell out. You don't know what to just take a look. Just take a look because it's not going to look good. And it could be the most innocent thing. It could have just some trash that fell out, but it's not going to look good if you get nabbed. Anything else drivers should know or fleet should know as we because uh, it's about wow, this is coming up. It's a little over two weeks away. Yeah, a little over two weeks. Um, be nice to the inspectors. Clean your yeah. vehicle, because if they come in and search, if you give them permission or if they have probable cause to search uh, for whatever reasons, they're going to search everything. If you have dirty underwear in there, they're going to go through it. Um, people you hide get drugs and alcohol in all kinds of places. Is it true you can get a ticket for an unmade bed in your cab? I saw like a video, and I don't know if it was a, I don't know if it was a fake video, but I saw a video, and this cop was harassing this guy because his bed wasn't made and wrote him a ticket. No. Now, what you do have to have is you have to have bedding in your sleeper okay. berth to count it as a sleeper berth. So, but if you never use it as a sleeper berth, you don't have to have anything in there. Yeah. Yeah. And these, these guys are going to be over <laughs> your truck. Um, where can people get more information about this from your team so they can get prepared? Nobody wants to, nobody wants to get nailed over something stupid and you want to be safe because there's a reason behind all this stuff. Well, they can contact me directly. Um, they can email me at mark period barlar b a r l a r at reliancepartners.com. For information on what they're checking, you can go to www.roadcheck.org. That's going to take you to the CVSA's website, and it's going to you have a flyer there that tells you exactly the process that I explained and what the officers are going to be looking for. Mark, thank you so much. You have a tremendous weekend. Take care, and thanks for stopping by as always. Take care. Take it easy. Now, all of you, let's see you in person in Atlanta. The future supply chain is coming. That is June 4th and 5th. If you use my code, WTT, 
FOSC24, I believe. You'll, you'll get the lowest price out there. Uh, there's going to be Freight Waves versus DIT in the Great Freight Debate. Ryan Peterson's going to be there. We're going to have live what the trucks. It's going to be a time. Live.freightwaves.com to get all that information. You want to connect with me, find me on Twitter or LinkedIn at Timothy Dooner. That's D O O N E R. If you like the show, you can find it across social at FW What the Truck. Look on your podcast player. Look up What the Truck. You can hear this on demand. Sirius XM's Road Dog Trucking Channel 146. Or, of course, Freightways YouTube channel. Just look up What the Truck. Take care and don't be a stranger. I'll see you soon, Dad. <laughs>